So the founding father of the empirical science, and God rest his soul, he's a good man. I'm sorry to say this, but this is exactly what I've been saying the whole goddamn time, was a brand promotion scheme. It was an advertisement for cognitive therapy. That's what the science did. So if the science is really fucking brand promotion, how the hell is that actually going to work at the level of integrity? It didn't. So hello, um, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Anagogi podcast. Um, today I have uh, has a guest, um, Tim, and he's a very uh, special person and someone that I actually wasn't very familiar with until very, very recently. Uh, but he has a lot of interesting thoughts. Uh, he has developed a lot of um, interesting that ideas that I think are pretty important, but very seldom uh, discussed and I hope to kind of unpack a lot of his ideas here because I, th I think they're they're well deserving of of publicity and of discussion so welcome and, and thank you for coming hey thanks so much for having me uh, it's really nice to be here I appreciate the invitation awesome so um, something funny that um, about me discovering your work is that as, as I mentioned to you before I first discovered you through your brother, Tim. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because, no, no, your brother. Um, how is his name? I forgot. Yeah, Tim, Tim. Oh, sorry, I actually conf conf uh, confused the names. But so, um, so I, I first uh, came across uh, your work through him, uh, which is very odd because it has nothing to do with psychology whatsoever. It's just because, um, like your brother, I'm also kind of in the powerlifting uh, okay. context. Yeah, well, it's, it's... And I think, I think I posted something about consciousness or something like that. And he was like, well, actually, my, my, my brother does a lot of work on consciousness. You should check it out. And I think he sent me an art article of yours. And I kind of, I didn't have much time. So I kind of skimmed it. And I was like, you know, well, this looks cool, but it's very theoretical. And I was like, okay, maybe I'll check it some other time. And I kind of like made a mental note of coming back to it later. But then I just, I just kind of forgot about it. But then sometime later, I was kind of my normal YouTube you know, yep. time wasting. And I saw a new video by Verveke. Yeah. And I'm like, this name is familiar. Like, Greg, where have I done this before? Right. And then I couldn't believe that it was the same person because right. the context is, is so different. Totally different. And then I like, kind of like stalked your brother on Facebook to uh -huh. see if I could find your profile to uh -huh. like uh -huh. confirm if yeah, it's the it is same a, guy yeah. or not. That's right. There's the powerlifting <laughs> Tim and John Verveke, and I am connected to both those characters. <laughs> Amazing. I, I really <laughs> Small world that. phenomena for sure. It is. And so, and, and that, and then I watched that video, the, the, the original video, which I, I don't remember which one. And, and, and I liked you immediately. Like, like I really like your personality. You have a very <laughs> uh, strong, exciting personality, which <laughs> sometimes doesn't vibe very well with me for some reason. <laughs> but in your case, I, I liked you immediately. Oh, good. But well, thank you. a very curious factor is that I kind of had two systems going on like w once you've kind of dived into the once, once you've been into this kind of science philosophy kind of realms for a while you can't develop heuristics when you hear new ideas you know sure. sometimes something sounds right sometimes some, something doesn't even if you haven't looked into it uh, very in depth and so with you i kind of had two alarm systems on my head banging one is like this guy is really smart like you should you should definitely check out more of his work and another alarm system was, this guy might be full of shit. Right. So be very skeptical. Definitely. Yeah. Of what he's saying. Like right. this looks right. overly abstract yep. and it looks too grandiose. Totally. So so like I was like, mm, I, I score high on the quack meter, Tiago. Let's be very <laughs> exactly. clear about that. You score very high. I score very high uh, on the quack meter. Uh huh. And that's very odd because I generally, generally speaking, I don't have these two heuristics at mm -hmm. the same time it's either one or the, <laughs> right. one or the other right <laughs> yes I, I blur a lot of the radar detection systems that people uh try to send out there so i i send out a lot of confusing messages <laughs> right right that, that's certainly true so something that that i would kind of like to do uh, with it with this podcast is that when i've seen a lot of your talks i find it that what you're trying to communicate is often 
hard to communicate and and because the system that you have built is so complex uh you kind of try to give like a very brief overview so that things don't don't, don't take forever uh which is very reasonable but then the consequence that that I found of you doing that is that people don't get a sense of what it actually means like it it stays at such an abstract level that i have the impression that people just kind of get kind of get uh, i don't know impressed because it's so abstract and, and it makes strong claims without actually you know seeing the the core of it so something that i'd like to try to do is kind of um you know for people to get a more uh, rich understanding and so i, I would like to start uh, in, in the beginning to kind of get a background. I think a good place to start of something that you talk about often is is the enlightenment gap. So maybe let's start there as, as a background and then... Yeah, I really appreciate that, uh, all that opening. So thank you for that. Uh, the whole issue of quack meters is a really important thing that I have, you know, um, I own. <laughs> so let's, I'm not, uh, um, and it's, it, and I have a weird system. Let's be, um, it's also a very complex system. And, uh, you know, I kind of frame it as the, you know, these di- recently I've been framing it as the you talking language. So you talk, if I use that term, that's unified theory of knowledge. That's the overarching um, description of uh, the set of ideas um, that I developed. And now I developed this podcast, you talking with Greg. And then, so you know how language evolves and then it becomes. Uh, so uh, the thing that I like to share with people at a general level is, yeah, in terms of the idea architecture, it is very complicated and it gives rise to a particular way. It's it's sort of like trying to learn a new language. Uh, so it's not uncommon for me, people to say, hey, you know, I tried to look at your system, you know, for a couple of hours. I'm not sure if I got it all. OK. And my response to that for people just in terms of the system is like, well, if you wanted to learn French, OK, you wouldn't like drop into a, a, a you know a website and be like, oh, I want to learn French in these next two hours. You know, it's like, yeah, and I'm not sure I learned French in two hours. Like, yeah, you're not going to learn French in two hours. Um, so one of the things to kind of relate to this is, is to, it's a fundamentally new language system. Okay. Uh, that, that, that then requires us to rework a lot of the foundational concepts and categories that we're used to using, and it deploys them in a particular way. So that's just a backdrop. Um, but let's get into your point, because we want to make it kind of like clear for people. And I really appreciate that you picked up on the enlightenment gap. Okay. Um, so I am an academic. Uh, I think seriously about positioning this as, as articulating that there are fundamental problems in our knowledge, okay? Our knowledge architecture, like how we put our concepts and categories together to make sense out of the world. And the way I diagnose the fundamental problem is through this framing of the thing called the enlightenment gap. So let's talk a little bit about what that is. So what do we mean by the enlightenment? Well, the enlightenment emerges, uh, you know, in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. Um, it comes off the Renaissance. Uh, and in terms of the idea structure of the Enlightenment gap, uh, you get the birth of the modern empirical scientific, natural scientific enterprise, say, for example, between Galileo into Newton uh, and the emergence of matter in motion and how we can map that with calculus and develop the first major scientific paradigm, which is Newton's classical mechanical paradigm from science uh, mapping matter in motion. Okay. And so then we get the birth of science basically, and the power of the physical sciences to describe the behavior of matter in motion. That's an unbelievable shift uh, in our knowledge system. And that's crucial. Okay. They also get the modern philosophy. Really Kant is the first major modern philosophy and you get a revolution in in how to think about our knowledge in a particular way. Um, And so you get shifts in both philosophy and science that give rise to an enlightenment sensibility. Okay. Now, the, my argument is, is that if you look across the landscape right now, so just take a second and be like, get in your body, look out, hey, what do we know? And what is the state of our knowledge? Okay. My, uh, I would invite then anybody to look out and say, the state of our knowledge is a chaotic, fragmented pluralism. Okay, meaning that everybody's got (laughs) ideas all over the goddamn place. And there isn't much in the way of a coherent integration at a foundational core 
set of ideas that forms the center of understanding. We don't have that. Okay. Don't really have that. Um, so you kind of be like, okay, uh, then let's see if we can understand that chaotic fragmented pluralism. The enlightenment gap says that there are two foundational problems. Okay underlie why we're at a chaotic fragmented pluralism at the level of understanding that comes out of the enlightenment. Okay. The first is the proper is understanding the proper relationship between matter and mind. Okay, the first fundamental problem. So we don't have a good set of understandings and we can just put this in the mind body problem, okay? Hard problem of consciousness, what's the relationship between subjective and objective, et cetera. There's lots of different dualities, but fundamentally, we don't have a shared set of understanding about the proper relationship between matter and mind. Okay. Um, and the second half of the problem of the Enlightenment gap is we don't have a shared fundamental understanding between the relationship between scientific knowledge and the truth claims that it makes and social knowledge and the social construction of knowledge. Okay? And you can see this debate in the debate between sort of the um, stance that modernists and classical scientists take in relationship to knowledge. Oh, these are truth claims, uh, scientific realist truth claims that transcend culture. That's one set of ideas. And then you have the postmodern critique that says actually, no, science sits inside of the social construction of knowledge um, and it's always contextualized by issues of power, issues of emphasis, issues of sort of subjective or intersubjective value. And therefore, you cannot make transcendent knowledge truth claims. It's always embedded in a social constructed context. That's the postmodern critique. Okay. So the Enlightenment gap basically says out of the Enlightenment, a lot of cool knowledge happened, but not good synthetic holistic knowledge. Two huge problems emerge matter and mind science and social knowledge. Those things fail. The absence of solution to those created a chaotic, fragmented, pluralistic landscape. Okay, um, And so that's the current state. You talk, the unified theory of knowledge, solves slash resolves the enlightenment gap. It affords a clear philosophical system that places in proper relation matter and mind and scientific knowledge in relationship to social knowledge resolves both of those and affords a clear, coherent picture of our naturalistic into human knowledge. Perfect. And, and how does this enlightenment gap then kind of brings about uh, the problem of psychology? So, so let's, let's try to put it in context of, of the results that had in, in the 20th century for, for, for this, for this field in specific, which is what you focus on. Totally. Right. So the you talk is really entangled in three different problems. OK. Uh, and the first problem I actually encountered talking about keeping it real. OK. I'm a, I'm a clinician and I was going to, you know, just I go into the world. I'm going to be a psychological doctor, help people talk about their problems, <laughs> you know. And when you sit down and talk with people about the real problems, that's a real it's a real issue. And you have to you have to be real in relationship to that. Um, so the thing that I encountered in my training was what I call the problem of psychotherapy. The problem of psychotherapy is the problem that you have all of these different approaches about what I, as a psychological doctor, should pay attention to. Okay, Should I pay attention to your behaviors and your habits? Should I pay attention to your emotions? Should I pay attention to your relationships, your defenses? Should I pay attention to your beliefs? Should I pay attention to your existential values? Should I pay attention to your systems, family systems, social systems? Should I pay attention to your development? Should I pay attention to your biology? Okay. Um, and the answer, of course, at some levels, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, but what you get in psychotherapy is you get these different schools of thought. You get family systems theory, you get behaviorism, you get cognitive therapy, you get psychodynamic, you get emotion focused. And they all have key insights. Okay. But they, you back up and you don't find coherence. You just back up into what are called schools of thought or sometimes called paradigms. And the paradigms themselves can't be tied together into any meta true paradigm. Okay. I had the idea as I saw that when I was in graduate school, which seems, I think is pretty common sense, but nobody's really done this before. 
If you look at medicine, okay, Western medicine, you can make the case that Western medicine is fairly coherently organized. It's of course a lot of debate, a lot of issues. But if we look at Western medicine, you see that, okay, there's a general doctor, for example, he looks at your overall health and they have all these specializations, okay? You have specializations in different organ systems, okay? You go to your circulatory doctor, your gastrointestinal doctor, your reproductive doctor, okay? And they'll specialize in certain diseases. And they all get networked together because medicine is anchored to the science of human biology. And human biology is actually relatively well organized. In fact, very few people dispute whether human biology is a science. And the reason they dispute it, they don't dispute it's a science is because there's coherent organization of things like cells and organisms and bodily systems. And we can scientifically just study how those work and our scientific language systems help us clearly make sense out of those with a degree of coherence. And everyone agrees that human biology is a science and medicines an application off of that. Okay. I then moved up a level and I was like, here's all the psychotherapy stuff that look like they focus on different aspects of human psychology. And I was like, well, why don't we organize all of these different schools of thought that are focusing on different parts to help people through the science of human psychology? Okay. So then you would have this, you'd have this parallel. You'd be like, okay, well, actually engineering and physics, that works. Now you have medicine and biology, you have psychological doctors. They should be organized by the science of human psychology. Okay. When I actually went back to then say, well, what is the science of human psychology that I could use to organize the psychotherapy? I discovered nobody knows what the fuck psychology is. Okay. Which was a mind fuck. Okay. It's sort of like, I knew this, but I didn't know this. The field knows this, but it doesn't know this. It's one of the most fundamental issues, in my estimation, that is glossed over in the academy. Okay, meaning it's unbelievable. Since what do I mean by that? Since 1899, eight before the 20th century, psychologists, theoretical psychologists were saying this very, very clear point. People mean different things by the terms in psychology. Okay, there's no agreement on what people mean by consciousness or mind or mental process or behavior. OK, so everyone had different areas that they were focused on. Some people focused on overt patterns. Some people focus on the brain. Some people focus on information processing. Some people focus on subconscious. Some people focus on self-conscious. OK, those are all different potential reference for this thing called psyche, psychology, mind, behavior. And different schools of thought have different reference points. OK, it would be like biologists, meaning fundamentally different things by what a cell is or what DNA is. Biologists all agree on what a damn cell is. OK, and they agree on the set of living behaviors. Well, psychologists never got agreement on the reference point of what it is that their field is about. OK, that's called the crisis of psychology. And then I rechristened it the problem of psychology, which is why is it? that psychology can't tell you what its subject matter is about with any clarity. Why is it that we have to have many different schools of thought that carve up the set of behavior and mental processes in totally different ways and use totally different languages to emphasize different features of that thing and they don't correspond or connect? So you get the problem of psychology, which is, hey, we don't have any goddamn agreement about what the subject matter of our field is. And that's amazing when you think about it. It's like, I can't believe that. And then I realized, I went back to my training. It's like, actually, if you read between the lines, they tell you that. They tell you that if you know how to read it. It's in right there in Psych 101, okay? Because you- it's, not that, it's not even that uncommon. It's just that it's not emphasized. Like a lot of uh, psychology textbooks, they'll just- They'll just say it straight up. Yeah. Usually either in the beginning. Or, right. Or they'll say, the well, people like a unified. They're not really unified. But what we do is we apply the methods of science. That's what makes us key. So it's a method. Our identity as science is not based on the subject matter, scientific understanding. It's based on applying the methods so that the researcher or school of thought then applies the methods of science to whatever they find 
But the what's so this is the difference between what's called epistemology, grounding your epistemology of science. So we use methods, we measure shit, we do tests, independent, dependent variables, we behave like scientists, and we and we apply the language game of science. But there's this whole other issue called the ontology. Ontology, like what is the reality that you're measuring? Like the periodic table of behavior. That's not, I mean, the periodic table of the elements, sorry, the periodic table of the elements, like all those atoms. There's no method there. That's the ontology of that's a map of the ontology of atoms. Okay. That's what they discovered. So we want the ontology of mental behavior I mean, and process and all of that. And there's nothing, there's no shared ontology. So all we did was we then said, yep, you can't get a shared ontology. So screw it. We'll organize around methods. And that's what I actually technically called methodological behaviorism, which is like, oh, we apply the methods, we divide behavior out, which is accessible to our methods of science. Then we infer mental process. And that's the that's to the extent that there's any unification in in psychological science at all. That's the basic structure. And that's basically like, but we don't know what we mean by mental process. okay? or there's six million different reference and framings and and there's no consensus. So that's amazing to me. It's like, oh, my God, you don't. The problem of psychology is we don't have an ontological reference for the mental that we all agree on. And that's amazing. And we know it. But we then deny psychologists. We then deny that that's a problem. And we poo-poo it. And we pat people on the head that point it out and say, oh, well, it's just nice to have you unified. But that's your fantasy that you would know shit. And who cares? So just move on and start getting trained in the methods of science because that's the best we can do. And anybody that thinks that you can do more than that is a quack. I, th I think that's still a, a, tr a trauma that, that, that we have from the beginnings of psychology oh. that we're so... Uh, tied in with philosophy that we just have this this obsession of like being an empirical science totally uh, like we're, we're kind of the, the kid that keep that got bullied for so long that now it just has we have serious <laughs> physics envy as somebody said it uh you know and then we just try to parrot them ideas of physics and oh gosh we'll try to be science and yeah it's a it's a really sad i feel like the field is traumatized and then i think it got built in a fundamentally incorrect way uh, my current book in progress explains how we can move from this epistemological, methodological behaviorism to what I call mental behaviorism, which is grounded in an ontology of the mental. It tells you exactly what you mean by mental and gives you vocabulary to map the mental with a coherent, integrated, pluralistic clarity that they say, oh, I know now what you're talking about. Now we can get clear on the ontology of the mental. So uh, one area that, that tried to to fix that problem, or at least present itself as a solution, was evolutionary psychology uh, when when it when it first totally. uh, started, you know, and and in a way that was tied to the context of how how evolutionary psychology started and and emerged and was kind of like this new thing, and I think part of the reason why it seems so appealing as as a unifier is because it brings everything together in terms of origin. It's like, what is the ultimate origin of human behavior? It's like, well, it's evolutionary theory because we're evolutionary products. Um, and, and even today, they, they kind of make that claim. Like in, in, in the textbook that I have, uh, Buss uh, makes that claim. Like evolutionary psychology is a unifier of psychology. Totally. So, um, so, so why do you think that's not the case? Where does it fail Totally. Uh, to, to fulfill that promise. Great. All right. Uh, I, and I agreed with this, actually, when, in 1995. So I discovered the problem of psychotherapy in 1994. Okay. And evolutionary psychology is just getting hot at that time. Uh, the adaptive mind is sort of the boggle of evolutionary psychology. It came out in 1992. Uh, Pinker's The Language Instinct came out in 1994. Um, I then was was making this issue. I was like, well, hey, well, I'm going to look for the biggest, broadest um, position that anchors into natural science that would afford me a picture of what's going on so I can coordinate this. And boom, evolutionary psychology was hot at the time. And I saw it. And then I realized I didn't really understand evolutionary theory. So I then started really training myself in evolutionary theory and was super excited about evolutionary psychology Okay, for two years. All right. Um, and completely absorbed everything I could read about that and identified for two years as an evolutionary psychologist um, and went to conferences and things along those lines and was very impressed um, with the basic architecture. Okay, um, But then I stumbled into an idea 
Uh, and then I had another set of ideas that then changed and revealed evolutionary psychology to be a school of thought paradigm that wasn't up to the task of actually solving the depth of the problem that we faced. Okay. Um, so it's structured in a way that actually uh, does not afford the actual necessity of the solution. Um, and there were a couple of things that made that, uh, made that realization for me. So one thing that I would just say, so when David Buss says, hey, it's the unifying thing, what does David Buss mean by evolutionary psychology? Like, does, that, does, does the evolved cognitive modules that's studied by evolutionary psychology, where is that all animals? Does, it, does he refer to, so is evolutionary psychology the science of all animals? Um, is it the science of just humans? Um, where does the evolved cognitive domain module architecture begin in nature? And what is the referent point in terms of sort of like, do you do an evolutionary psychological analysis of rat behavior? Um, is that, how does that relate to things like behavioral ecology, sociobiology, and the analysis of animals? Okay. Um, that's a question actually evolutionary psychologists struggle with enormously. Okay. You can get in Daly and Wilson basically have a very, they're prominent evolutionary psychologists. They have a very nice article. It's like, Hey, are we talking about animals in general here? <laughs> are we talking about just humans? Okay. And if we're talking about just humans, what actually is the referent that we're talking about, about these domain specific cognitive modules that are solving problems? Clearly they're, if, if our subject matter is the domain specific cognitive modules, that afford the capacity for adaptive behavior, then actually our subject matter is essentially the mental lives of all animals. Okay. But uh, sorry, I, I don't understand why, why exactly that is a problem, especially because kind of the problem that we have when we jump from animals to humans, what's particularly problematic is, is the, the concept of self-awareness, right? And, and th this is really intricate, especially because of language, of, of, of subjectivity, uh, you know, realizing itself, basically. But a, a key aspect of evolutionary psychology, it actually doesn't depend that much on, on self-awareness because kind of most of the claims that it makes is that you have drives that are not conscious at all. So, so, I, I, so I don't actually understand what, what's, what the problem is of, of delineating the problem between animals and humans. Why, why can't evolutionary psychologists make the claim there's modules that just... Uh, make us prone to certain behaviors uh, because they're evolutionary uh, advantage, and that goes all the way down. What, what's the so, problem with that? There's no problem with that, the, the, uh, and that's what they say. But the question is, I want to know what you mean by the reference psychology. That's, that's all I'm saying. Uh, and so if your reference of psychology basically is, oh, these are interesting module, these are interesting cognitive science modules, then evolutionary psychology should correspond directly with ethology. Ethology is the science of animal behavior. So I would want to then know to, to mo monitor animal behavior. And indeed, E.O. Wilson makes this whole point. You guys are, are you doing sociobiology and behavioral ecology or not? And then what's the difference? Or are you basically just going to now say, okay, psychology is the referent of the human. And if so, why? What's the justification? What, what is, so what do you mean by the psychological referent? Sometimes they mean, oh, I, I'm a psychologist, so I have to study humans, but that's certainly not the case. Comparative psychology, behavioral psychology has always been about animals. So it's very ambiguous about what the psychological referent is. The insights are the, so the scientific insights that, hey, we can apply modern evolutionary theory and cognitive science to humans, totally fine with that. But I'm trying to, I'm saying that the part of the issue is how, what's your map and what's your referent, okay? The other thing is exactly the point you made. And really, this is what actually happened to me. Okay. And what happened to me was in 1996, all right, I'm diving into evolutionary psychology. All right. And I'm seeing its struggles. It has serious struggles with certain other schools of thoughts perspective, most notably the social constructionist view of reality. Okay. The social constructionist view of reality emphasizes the fact that we in, are embedded in socio-historical justificatory context. They don't usually use that word, but the, basically the belief value networks that legitimize is and ought emerge in a socio-historical context. And the knowledge systems that we have sit in the sociology of knowledge. Okay, And you have to have a perspective that affords you an understanding of that from a social constructionist perspective. And there's a lot of debate then as to whether evolutionary psychology with its naturalistic focus 
affords that clarity? And does evolutionary psychology really have an idea about what it is that happened to launch culture, okay, and the evolution of culture in a very clear way? There's certainly ideas, people like Dawkins and memes, and virtually everybody says, oh, yeah, culture really takes off. Well, the key insight, chronologically, the key insight that started the unified theory was an evolutionary analysis of language, self-reflective awareness, and the evolution of what I then call the culture plane of existence. Okay, And here's the basic nutshell. And this was the key insight in 1996 that was a fundamental shift. Okay, And then when I really, what happened essentially is there's a fundamental shift that changes us from primates into persons. Okay, And the nature of that fundamental shift is grounded in evolutionary understanding, but then has a life of its own (laughs) that is actually not effectively reducible to domain specific modules. Okay, And thus the fundamental insight of evolutionary psychology, which is important, is definitely incomplete. All right. And many of the claims they make that there are no domain general specific modules is iffy. Okay. Uh, and problematic. Well, from my understanding, it's just plain wrong from, from some findings in, in, in cognitive science. It's wrong to me, basically, it gets wrong on both accounts. There's a general, actually, the, there becomes a general behavioral investment principle, okay, uh, at the level of animal, which is a which has domain and whether everything's relative in terms of what you emphasize. So the dynamic between general and specific is always a dialectic. And they didn't, sane people wouldn't deny any possibility of general, So, but they would paint the behaviorist as always being excessively general. And then the behavioral critique or, or whatever that's on a more general is like, oh, you're being a sexively specific. So everybody's in a general versus specific dialectic. Um, and so we should agree that clearly there are general processes and principles that are guiding, say, learning and behavioral process. And there are domain specific elements that will constrain a particular response and get channeled in for particular kinds of behavioral repertoires that are unique to that issue. Almost everybody has that basic dialectical model. Okay. Uh, but so, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Um, so let, let's get into, you know, your, your actual framework, but let, let's try to, to, to break it down. So maybe we can start with the, with a tree of knowledge system. And then we kind of build it from there. So that it's kind of in smaller chunks. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so the tree of knowledge system uh, is the second key insight chronologically. It happens in 1997. Um, and it becomes the first key insight on the thing behind me, which is the tree of life. <laughs> okay. Um, so I got trees all over the place. <laughs> uh, but the tree of knowledge um, is a new map of big history. Okay. Big history is a general, I didn't know about big history at the time, uh, but I'm happy to place it in that context. So uh, there's a whole set of ideas called big history, which basically tracks the evolution of complexity um, across the universe uh, from the big bang, big beginning. um, And from there, you get sort of this pure energy. And then you go across time and things evolve and you get particles into atoms. And then you get things like stars and galaxies and molecules at certain places. You get the planet Earth, you get life. And that extends and eventually a life happens and then ultimately people happen and then modern society happened. And big history maps the evolution of complexity on the time by complexification axes. OK, um, so those are uh, and that's a very general frame. It's pretty popular. It was started by a man by the name of Dave Christian. Um, it, so if you look up big history, you'll see there's got journals and and I'm part of that society. I was a keynote uh, speaker to it. Um, I'm not super involved in it, but I've been doing my own parallel thing. OK, the tree of knowledge is a new map of that. OK, and what it does is it says that too many systems, almost all systems, have had a single dimension of complexification, meaning, and indeed big history, it's got just eight different thresholds. It goes from energy into particles, particles into atoms, atoms into molecules, then into life, and then it goes into humans, and then science and technology, and blah, 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 and modern society. There are eight thresholds, okay? Each one of them is seen as a particular jump. If you look at the tree of knowledge, the, uh, the classic standard tree of knowledge, you immediately will see the time Access by complexification, but something will jump out at you. And what jumps out at you is that it's shaped in four different sort of upside down funnels, if you look at it. Okay. Uh, and the first funnel coming out of energy is the matter funnel. Okay. 
Uh, and that refers to the dimension of material complexity on three dimensions of space, one dimension of time. This is what um, the dimension that Newton maps, okay? In classic matter in motion, it's the stuff we see <laughs> and live in uh, on the inanimate material plane, okay? Then what you see is life as a different dimension of complexity, okay? And, and the geometrics of this is really where the logic is. You see life evolving out of matter, okay? But the way in which particles become atoms and atoms become molecules is one kind of emergent evolution, okay? Meaning that particles get together, then they form atoms, atoms have certain properties, they get together, they form molecules, molecules have, these are, but these are properties that emerge and they're different and they're important, but they emerge within the matter dimension, okay? When you get to life, you get a whole new dimension of complexification, okay? And I can explain what I mean by that, all right? but it's a higher order dimension of existence, okay? And it's a fundamentally different kind of shift. And what the tree of knowledge says is if you go from matter, so that's one dimension, then you jump into life and that's cells and living organisms, okay? And then it follows that evolution since say 3.8 billion years ago to about mm, 550 million years ago, 700 million years ago, it depends on what you wanna do it. And then what happens, especially at like what's called the Cambrian explosion, is the evolution of another dimension of complexification, which I call capital M mind, okay? Which basically refers to minded animals. So minded animals or mindedness or mental behavior, we can explain what I mean by this, emerges on top of life, just like life emerges on top of matter. And it emerges as a whole new dimension of complexification, okay? And getting clear about the meaning of this kind of emergence is key, and why new dimensions of complexification are different than how things, properties emerge in, from aggregates and other kinds of issues within a dimension, okay? Um, and then finally, you get the evolution from uh, across the animal kingdom, all the way from things like insects up to chimpanzees and us 5 million years ago as a kind of primate. And over the last 5 million years, in particular, the last 500,000 years, in particular, the last 200 to 50,000 years, we have seen a new explosion, okay, uh, of a new dimension of complexification coming out of the animal, what I call the culture plane or culture person plane of existence, okay? And that is exactly what you were referring to is, huh, humans are different. There's a explicit language-based self-conscious recursive system of processing on top of the mental processing. And that evolution, the evolution of culture, or the culture person plane of existence is yet another stack that emerges out of the animal mental plane, which emerged out of the organism life plane, okay? Um, and I don't, I'll just stop, I'll say one more thing. Each, what makes a new plane, each plane of existence emerges out of the other as a function of information processing, and communication networks. That's what actually gives rise to the key feature of a new plane. It's an information process, like cells process information and you get cell-cell communication, okay? The animal nervous system processes information, you get animal-animal communication. And then humans symbolically process language-based information and then engage in human-human language-based communication. And that information process and communication network is what gives rise to a novel, plane of existence. We've had three of them because we've got cells, DNA, nervous system, and language. That's being the fundamental. And that gives you a new map, of the evolution of big history on both the evolution of thresholds like atoms to molecules within a dimension, and then these dimensional jumps. And, the, and then it points to things that are joint points between the dimensional jumps, like the joint point between matter and life, and then there should be joint points between life and mind and mind and culture and the science or, or the understanding identification of those joint points are really, really key. So. Perfect. That, that was, that was great. So something that kind of confuses me a bit is that can do, you kind of ground this, this evolution in, in information theory, as you, as you described. And the, the tricky part is kind of like on the later stages um, of that, particularly associated with, with biology and associated uh, with the mind. So one of my questions is, uh, what's so special about your approach? Because information theory has kind of 
been around for a long time and there was a lot of it was a big thing in the 20th century uh, with uh, cybernetics and also when chaos theory came around and stuff like that. So so what exactly is, is special about taking this information uh, processing approach? Um, and also, how are you able to, to scale back and then make uh, kind of ontological distinctions about this, the, the, the systems of information because 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 one problem about about these jumps is how exactly uh, they happen and and then there's kind of two approaches either you say that it's continuous and that it that it's continuous forever or you say that there's a jump that there's emergence and and both have 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 their problems uh, but I'm not sure exactly how you solve any of these because if if it's continuous. Uh, then how exactly is there all these kinds of properties that didn't exist before? But if there's a jump, like uh, how how exactly does that jump? Th- how exactly does, does that occur? Because emergence is, is very complicated, and we don't quite understand it very well. Right. Okay. So a number of different. So there's the emergence issue uh, versus reduction, continuity, discontinuity, dynamics. That's, there's that, and then there's the nature of information science. Uh, I would say information science. Uh, information theory, okay, and and uh, there's also w- how we think about information in terms of semantics and semiotics. So I like to sort of distinguish in terms. Of, we get into information. There's like Shannon information theory, which is about really fundamentally relates to things like um, reduction of uncertainty, message content, uh, algorithmic processing. You then get into information science, which is things like artificial intelligence, cybernetics, information processing systems. There's also semiotics and uh, semantic information uh, notions. So information is a really complicated concept. Uh, It's important to divide it out into various domains. It is a central concept in psychology, I would argue. Okay. It emerged in the cognitive revolution. We can talk about that. what this basically says, and what is what some people have alluded to, but nobody specified by like the tree of knowledge, is it just zooms out and says, oh, yes, the development of an information processing system and communication network is absolutely key, and complex adaptive systems, uh, chaos, chaos theory, all the things that emerge, say, at the Santa Fe Institute, and what they're doing, they're all pointing out that we need a science of these kinds of things. And it's a little different than the reductive physicalism. Uh, So virtually everybody says that. So I'm totally on board with that. Tree of knowledge is very consistent with, say, chaos, complex, adaptive, dynamic systems theory. Okay. But as Jim Rutt and Jordan Hall, a lot of uh, people who I hang out with um, at the Santa Fe Institute, nobody um, took that and then said divided up nature and basically, uh, yeah, you have gen- genes and cells as one kind of information processing medium. You have nervous system and animals as another and humans and language as another. And you utilize that taxonomy. So you share across the complex adaptive systems and then you s- show that the mediation of the complex adaptive process, cells, organisms, animals, nervous systems can be just divided in that regard. And it's amazing, you know, in retrospect, my always, yeah, that's really, that's pretty straightforward. But actually you look and uh, essentially nobody, there are a few people have certainly seen that. But in terms of making that the key point, and what I also do is I then bring, um, when you look at the joint points, uh, like the life to mind um, or matter to life, life to mind, mind to culture, I then utilize what's called a meta-theoretical causal explanatory analysis to look at like, okay, yeah, how do we understand life to mind? Okay. There's thing in the unified theory, the third key idea in the unified theory uh, that on the tree back there is called behavioral investment theory. Behavioral investment theory is a meta theoretical structure that organizes the evolution, the framing of evolution, the causal explanatory feedback for how we would go from living organisms into animals that have nervous systems that engage in mental behavior, sensory motor looping, and the kind of mental behaviors that we would see. So it's a theory then about the emergence of animal behavior. All right. And then it affords you a particular, and it integrates across things like behavioral science, ethology, neuroscience, animal cognitive ethology, um, meaning the way in which nervous systems process information, evolutionary psychology, it's a meta-theoretical structure that integrates across the cognitive behavioral neuroanimal sciences, okay? And affords then an explanation for what kind of complexity building feedback loop 
generated a process that actually that has certain continuity with the past and discontinuity. That's the key. It's both continuous and there is a feedback loop of generative discontinuity, which we can talk about. Um, I make the claim that yes, these are different novel ontological uh, entities. Uh, mind is a novel ontological entity in the universe. We can explain what I mean by that in relationship to I am an emergentist. Okay, um, I certainly think that novel properties uh, and novel even causal structures do emerge, and I can explain what I mean by that. Um, but uh, the bottom line is, is that so totally agree with complex adaptive dynamic information systems that's wo woven in there. This basically says, yes, and we need to think about the mediums of the information processing. We can look at the lens of living behaviors, mental behaviors, and cultural behaviors. We see them as different mediums. We can use complex adaptive dynamic systems, chaos theory, and other things to understand that. And at the same time, you're going to see fundamentally different patterns in different mediums. Um, so that's one aspect of the of the issue. We can come back to continuity, discontinuity, reductionism, and emergence, uh, if, if you'd like. But that's some of the reflections. Got it. Um, sweet. And but for example, um, kind of leaving like the very history, early history of the of the universe. For example, uh, regarding about conceptualizing these these advances as as information. Um, what's wrong with, for example, something like even like Dawkins in in the selfish gene, for example, he framed it in terms of information, and he framed it both in terms of genes, which was actually kind of the genius at the time because. The, the biological mechanism wasn't known. So he actually dispensed that entirely. And he's like, it doesn't even matter what it is. Like it's information and that's what carries on. So he already implied that that, that was kind of the, the mechanism of, of, of this early stage of life. And he also said, this is how it applies to culture as well. So, so, so what, what, what is actually is the novelty that something like the, the, the claims that Dawkins made that that wasn't sufficient. I mean, I, I'm I. Uh, that's a he's got some very key pieces of information there. I mean, I mean, I put you know. So for example, um, the idea that there are the idea of memes uh, is a loose, reasonable notion of sort of the evolution of culture uh, in relation. The question though is like, what's our real understanding about how how do you get to meme mimetic? What actually is mimetic? Production. He basically, oh, just any idea replicates itself. The form of memes is very, very not. I, I would argue is pretty loose ontologically. It's not very crisp. And the emergence of memes, like what what actually is the underlying root cause in the language of the tree of knowledge? What fundamentally is the joint point that gives rise to this? Say we'll call culture. We'll use Dawkins' term tied together by meme plexus. Okay, let's say culture is tied together by meme plexus. Well, that's an interesting descriptive phenomenon. You can say, hey, OK, and, I, and obviously Susan Blakemore and other people, they pull out of that and they say, hey, this is a really useful concept. I agree. OK, um, is it clear about how mean plexes emerge and why mean plexes have the structural functional organization that they do? And what was the complexity building feedback that gave rise to mean plexes? And what is the relationship between mean plexes at the large scale system of cultural organization and us as individual human beings? OK. My argument is justification systems theory kicks the shit out of all of that because it specifies with huge amounts of precision what's the causal explanatory process by which organizations of language network together into large scale systems of justification, which is a much better description of the way in which at least propositional language networks are organized. And I can tell you exactly, well, what's the center of them? What's the core organization? What are peripheral systems of justification? How do they move about? How do they blend into technological structures? Why do they give things like national character and religious structures the way that they do at the large scale system? And I can tell you at a human psychological level, what is the relationship between your reflective ego your justifying mind, your persona out here, how you manage your impressions and social relationships, and your primate experiential self, and the dynamic filtering that your justifying mind engages in relationship to your felt mind, why we have the psychodynamics that we do, why do we manage our impression the way that we do, and what is the complex adaptive dynamic networks that operate at the level of human psychology. So memeplex shit doesn't do anything in relationship to that. It's just sort of like, oh, so he's pointing to something that's useful. He's showing us that, okay, there's an information network kind of parallel. Everybody jumps on that with good utility, 
but you can do a hell of a lot better with structural functional analysis given by justification system at both the culture and person level in relationship and explain why it would have taken off the way that it does and have the adaptive design structural features that it does. It's a complete reverse engineering of human consciousness and culture. And that meme plex doesn't give you that at all. That's perfect because I wanted to get into the justification hypothesis now. So, so, so that's that's a perfect bridge. So so let's try to unpack that a little bit. And and, and I would like you also to kind of uh, precisely define what you meant by justification because I think that might be a bit confusing for people that are not uh, used to that language. Totally. So I use the word justification. Uh, that that word grew and became a. Uh, I use it enormously broadly. Okay, uh, so so I do use it broadly. Um, any proposition, which is a meaning making linguistic statement, okay, that's meaning content. There are the antelope. Okay, that is a tree, a proposition. Okay, the definition of a proposition is a semantic statement as meaning content. Okay, my argument basically is is that that is when you when placed in the world, we should interpret that as a justification. Okay. Basically, it's legitimizing a particular claim and it's being given <clears throat> by some energy. We're talking about it for a reason. Um, so the concept of justification is what basically what it says is you have a propositional network system. The way to think about that propositional network is each one of those propositions is like a brick. Okay. Call each one a justification and then network the bricks together to give rise to a justification system. They intersect as a complex adaptive dynamic system to legitimize both is, there is based claims, that's true, that's true, that's true, that's not true, that's not true, and ought claims, that's what we should do, that's what we shouldn't do, okay? So propositions make is ought uh, meaning making statements. I wanna call them justifications, okay? I'll explain why very broadly. They get networked into systems of justification because the way we coordinate our is ought relations in the intersubjective culture person plane is actually through the process of justification. We're constantly legitimizing is and ought. Okay? That's the problem. So that we can coordinate our behavior and gain influence and investment pattern flow as primates. So we're primates that are investing and influencing each other. And then we're persons that build systems of justification that coordinate, legitimize is and ought. And then we utilize that to create a structure of shared, socially constructed understanding of our roles, of what reality is, of what we ought to do, because it legitimizes is an ought. And then if we get in trouble, then we engage in processes of justification to determine, do we need to update? Do we need to evolve? Do we need to shift? And then all of a sudden you can then break and then all, you know, all sorts of things get involved there. So one basic issue is I use the word justification very broadly. Each individual meaning-making propositions can be thought of as like a, just, a unit of justification, and then they are networked into um, uh, justification systems that operate when people get together, have shared sense of meaning, understand what your roles are, understand what the task is, and then negotiate justification dynamics to coordinate um, what you're doing at the level of influence and investment. How does that relate to, to the work of uh, Mercier and, and Spurg? Spurberg, I'm not sure, I'm probably butchering that, but you know, you know who I mean. I know who you mean. <laughs> so how, how does that relate? What are the differences? Well, uh, I mean, uh, basically, um, without getting too much into it, uh, so Mercy and Spurberg basically developed in 2011, they had a, um, uh, I think it was 2011, brain behavior science article, okay, that basically argued that argumentation, all right, um, is the sort of a key process. I reached out to Mercier in 2013 and said, oh, by the way, in 2003, I argued that justification, which I would argue includes your argumentation, all right, um, is a better frame. And it does, it includes what you're doing. I really appreciate the collective intelligence model that you guys do because you emphasized, I, I mentioned this as an implication of justification, but you guys are elaborating that we can engage in argumentation. It leads better reasoning. You know, but that was embedded in justification. Okay. That was in 2013. I wrote to Hugo Mercier. I then shared my chapter on the justification hypothesis and all my literature in relationship to it. Well, in 2017, they produced a book on a novel theory of human reasoning, which argued that basically the central problem was justification and argumentation. That was interesting. 
Okay. And it was interesting to me then that I was not cited at all, even though Hugo Mercer wrote back to me and said, oh, thank you for this. This Clearly a parallel ideas. And by the way, mine was published eight years earlier than theirs in the record. And then I shared that and he read it. And then four years later, these are moved his position for Sperber and Mercer, moved the position directly in line with my position and then claimed that they had a new evolution of reasoning hypothesis that nobody had ever generated before. So I was not super happy with that particular structure. Uh, so the bottom line is, is that everything that they're saying about the evolution of reasoning is already embedded in justification dynamics. Um, and in fact, I was going to take their route. So there, I was trained as an empirical psychologist. Okay. So my job as an empirical psychologist is so you have hypotheses, you know, so the methods of science are you make a prediction that's potentially falsifiable. You compete it with other things and start and start doing studies on stuff. In 1996, I developed this justification hypothesis. I, I didn't call it that at the time, but it was the whole idea that the, the short and when we get into the actual reverse engineering, the basic issue is this. Once propositional network claims emerge, okay, so before there's propositional network claims, you have things, you have broken symbolic words, like their animal, okay? And we're, as, as human apes, okay, uh, we're very good at syncing up. We're, I'm a good at empathizing with you and vice versa. We're not much, but we have what's called shared attention and intention in ways that other animals don't. So we can sync up in what we're doing, engaging group activities together, like hunting, way better than others, because I can intuit and we can get collective shared understanding of what we're doing pre-verbally, okay? Um, humans have this capacity. And the argument is then as, as we're syncing up our minds, we then develop the symbolic tagging capacity, like antelope there, okay? Which starts to coordinate us at a symbolic level, all right? Then we get a symbolic syntactical shift, the symbolic syntactical shift then puts, moves these symbolic taggings into propositional meaning making network claims. Okay. There are the antelope. The unified theory, the key insight that I had is once we shifted from propositional claims, there are the antelope. Okay. A different kind of cognitive problem emerged. And the different kind of problem, once you make a truth claim that's shared, what it does is it opens up all sorts of negative space. Okay, explicit negative space that are opposite to this truth claim, either in is or ought. Okay, what do I mean by that? So there are the antelope. No, they're not there. They're over there. No, those are not antelope. Those are gazelle. Okay, anytime now I create a propositional claim, now all of a sudden what it does is it opens up negative counterfactual space. Okay, it becomes available. Okay, so what is, if it's a meaning making claim, now I can wonder the antithesis of that meaning, either in is or in ought. Okay, the ought then is, I don't care that they're over there. It's not relevant. There are rabbits over here and we should go hunt those. Okay, so there is ought space that gets opened up by propositions. Okay, and then what happens is, is that we develop cognitive gadgets that tap that space, how? In the form of questions. Okay. Why, what, when, how? Notice how easy those are, okay? You can now bring a, cognitive, a quick cognitive gadget question that challenges the is ought legitimacy of the proposition very easily. And that shows the availability of negative open space. If you hang out around a precocious three-year-old or four-year-old, you'll see, okay, that kids ask questions. There, there's an argument that no other animals ever ask a question. Some people think this gray parrot asked a question. Alex, the gray parrot asked a question. But there's a there's a whole dissertation. No other animals ever ask a question. Okay, humans, of course, by the time they're three, are peppering the advanced kids. Certainly by four, you're peppering everything with questions. Why? What? what how do you know, Dad? How do you know? Why? Why do we? Blah blah blah. You know, shut up, kid. That's the way it is. Okay. But the point of it is, is that you know, once you have propositions, you can get to negative space through question. This becomes the problem of justification. OK, and the problem then of justification is how do you legitimize the propositional claims that you make? And there are three facets, at least to this problem. One is the analytic problem. Is it true? OK, like how do you defend the claim? All right. There's also then interest problems like my interest, like why am I bringing this justification now personally? And then there's social interest. Should we be attending to this justification of all possible justifications? And are we thinking about it in the right way? So you have an analytic problem. Is it true? Then you have the interest problem from the person and the group. 
okay, the other dyad or however many, the social problem. And basically then what you will get is then a competition for justifications on is ought that try to maximize issues of truth and personal and social interest. That's what the argument is. And it is this dynamic then that drives the ego as trying to justify my personal interests, and then the public shared consciousness where we try to justify our collective group interests. Okay. And the argument is, is that then you can really see the evolution of ego, self, culture, analysis of truth claims, then take off in relationship to the emergence of systems of justification, where people are building belief value networks that are trying to coordinate is all claims at the person group accuracy level. Okay? And if you apply that as a reverse engineering to human psychology and the secondary self-consciousness system that we have, okay, you can then be reverse engineer the hell out of that and be like, oh, I now exactly can see the relationship between my justifying mind and my feeling experiential mind and my public persona, because this tells you exactly the kind of dynamics that you would expect to see between these minds and the kinds of conflicts that they would emerge. And as a clinician, I can tell you it lines up pretty damn well. That was that was awesome, and that was that was a lot more elaborate than I than I've seen you uh, speak uh, on the topic. Obviously, I have a limited amount of exposure. It's not like I've uh, seen everything you put out. Um, th th that really enriched my my understanding, and it's 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 really fantastic. And and it, especially the way you nested the the several aspects of justification which is something i was that i was going to ask you about how, how does the the individual and the social um interact together so so that was great so the only thing that's kind of left to kind of have have this have have the core of the theory uh since we already briefly uh, mentioned the the behavioral investment theory aspect so maybe let's cover the the influence matrix because you, that kind of builds yeah on the behavioral investment on, totally. a, on a social level. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, so the behavioral investment is an idea basically about just the animal, how it approaches, avoids, expends energy. Okay. is shaped by evolution. It's behavioral genetics. It's a computational control system, which by the way, syncing up with John Berbeke has been golden because he's been helping me see the cognitive part. Neuro, I talked about neurocognitive functioning. Now I can take John's recursive relevance realization suck that sucker right in there and be like, oh my God, that's brilliant. Now we have a synergistic meta theory going there. Uh, and so the principle of learning then about basically a Skinnerian kind of reinforcement dynamic and life history development, that lays out your animal, base animal mind, okay? Fish into, you know, birds, everything gets complicated. Now we want to move up into the primate world, okay? Uh, I mentioned before, I will recommend the work of Tomasello. Michael Tomasello is a great uh, uh anthropologist, psychologist who studies um, this issue of the, the, uh, the, onto onto uh, uh, the theory of human development. I'm blanking on the book. It's a great book. I just read it. Anyway, what's it, the point he basically makes is very consistent with what's called the influence matrix. And that is this. Humans have this very, very sophisticated capacity for regulating self-other relationships that's pre-verbal. Okay. And a really simple example that Tomasella talks about is that kids, by the time they're two or three, very easily get the idea of pointing, okay? You point, you immediately understand that you, you look the other way because you immediately understand what's called shared attention and intention. You get my intention and then you can sync up my attention with my intention and now we can network together. Other apes are very, very clumsy, when it comes to really attending to the attention, intention, shared, what, what Thomas Fellow calls the ease with which we create we spaces, like we're in this together, we're playing together, we're engaged in shared imagination, and we do it without even verbal justification. We just immediately have some intuitive sense to sync up, okay? Um, and our hunting capacities and gathering capacities and coordinating capacities, probably, you know, they're all, that's all interconnected. Um, so, so that's the ability to share an implicit intersubjective space, to see your subjectivity and read it and empathize with it, see where it's going and sync up with it. Humans, before verbal capacity, we have a very, very advanced social ability, okay? The influence matrix says this, that humans, other animals have all of these different social needs, okay? Like for attachment, okay? Uh, for dominance, uh, they'll put particular roles, 
uh, that they'll play, but they'll be pretty differentiated in them. So a parental care mode, if we go into things like uh, evolutionary psychology analysis, a, a, a an animal might have a parental care mode that's very different than its dominance display mode. Okay, it's different than its reciprocity cooperative mode. The, the argument would be in many animals, these are different modules of relation that are framed. Okay, the influence matrix says in humans that this gets pulled together, and what we develop is a relationship system that monitors and integrates self other relationships. Okay, and combines an underlying attachment system. All right, with a cooperative competitive competitive system into then an integrated self other regulation system. Okay, and what it says is that we, because we're constantly involved in these role dances that are very very intimate, complex, constantly shifting, is that we integrated then these different domains and then created essentially a mapping field space. It actually, I just course it pulls off of maps from social space, like we have vertical and distancing and horizontal structures that actually we know we co-op from our perceptual space to create relational fields. Like it's not accidental, you look up to the king, okay? Uh, that puts it on a vertical axis and actually that corresponds to the way we think about vertical gravity <laughs> and power and things like that, it's interesting. So anyway, what the influence matrix says is that humans then shifted and integrated the process dimensions of relating and they use that to track the dynamic interplay that's going on in the social environment, okay? And it says there's a core, core central relationship, which is called the RVSI line, which stands for your relational value and social influence, okay? The relational value and social influence refers to how much are you known and valued by important others, that's relational value, okay? If, I, if you're really important to me, do you know me and do you value me? That's actually super crucial. Secondly, social influence, can I move you in accordance with my interests as a sort of instrumental resource kind of dynamic, okay? Do I have influence over you or not? So I'm tracking my level of influence over you, and of course you're doing vice versa, and I'm tracking my relational value. And the argument is that we have templates for high relational value, high social influence archetypally, and we can explain those, and we have archetypal templates for low relational value, low social influence. OK, trust me, as a clinician, when I talk about people's traumas, their archetype of low relational value, low social influence events in the relational trauma. OK, they're rejected, they're abandoned, they're criticized, they're disrespected, they failed and embarrassed themselves. OK, that's low relation. You've achieved, you've respected. This is what you desire. This is how you're known for. You do it very well. Everyone loves you for it. You're Tom Brady goat. OK, Woo OK, if Tom Brady fundamentally loves being a football player, and is known in value for being the greatest football player of all time, well, that's archetypal, high relational value, high social influence, okay? So the argument is we're tracking this, it's called the blue line. And then we're also tracking, that's actually comes out of our attachment system, okay? Our parental attachment, and then it generalizes to all of our other relations, okay? And I explain why it comes out of a secure versus insecure attachment structure. Then it generalizes to our relations. We also then monitor our distance and closeness and what's called the green line, it's called the freedom line, like how dependent and involved are we, how free from influence and obligation. We regulate that. And then we regulate the vertical line, which I call the power line, uh, most classically on a dominance and submission. But this can be direct dominance and control or indirect, like status issues, like are you a virtuous, good, competent player versus an incompetent player? That's a vertical relating. And then finally, there's horizontal relating, horizontal positive, which is affiliative love. Hey, brother, you know. Really appreciate all you're doing. He's doing great stuff out there, you know, making a big difference. I'm affiliating, identifying with you and pro-social attitudes toward you, liking, loving, connecting. And then there's negative red line, which is hostility, aggression, uh, contempt, uh, hurt the other individual because the interests diverge and you are conflicting. So what you get is a core black line and then three process dimensions, the blue vertical, red horizontal, uh, and green distancing line. Uh, and then that shows you the underlying dynamics in the world of influence internally. So I'm tracking my sense of relational value, my primate heart. I call it my primate heart. I'm tracking, hey, am I known in value? Do I have power? Do I have love? Do I have freedom? How am I bouncing back and form in relationship to those? And how then am I interpersonally dancing with you? Okay, so it's an interpsychic and interpersonal dance uh, that's happening between people, whoever's involved in, you know, dyad or triad, group, whatever. Um, and so there's an intrapsychic and interpersonal. That experiential self is 
moving your perceptual attention. It's regulating your felt sense of being. And it's capturing and organizing your system of justification. Well, their system of justification is also feeding back on it to create a dynamic interface. But this is the way we're really tracking influence, which basically is how am I going to be? How is it going to influence you? And how are you going to influence me back? That, that was amazing. And, and something that, I, that I'm finding very funny about this conversation is that a lot of these topics are clicking in my head a lot better. Mm. And they're clicking a lot better and I'm 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 hesitant to be cocky that it's just because I'm here that you're explaining it better. So 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 to me it's just funny that it kind of highlights the importance of having an, an actual conversation totally. to, to debate these topics rather than you know watching a lecture or whatever. Um, and and by the way, I, th I think the the book that you were mentioning, um, Human Ontogeny, I think. Yes, right? thank you. Mm -hmm. Like a, a yellow book, right? Yep, totally yellow. I have it. Uh, yep, actually, Becoming Human. Here it is. Sorry for my exactly. Um, well, a theory of human. Ontogeny. Yeah, there it is. Yep, theory. Yeah, yeah I, I read it, it um, a couple of years ago. It was it was fairly dense. Oh, it's a dense. It's a. Dense, it's a but... He's yeah. It was it wasn't an exciting read, but it's thick with the clarity. He lays out eight different. Uh, principles that really just articulate the shared attention, intentional space. And from the unified theory, that's like, oh my God, that's what's going on in the influence matrix, which makes our relationship system overlap with, but also quite different from the other great apes. And, and something that really surprised me about that book is that it really shifted how I thought about children. Because, uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to look at a very young child and it's like, this is just a very, very dumb piece of <laughs> meat, you know? Yep. And and I had this idea that, you know, young kids, I mean, they are they have some level of intelligence, but it, it's like somewhat in the level of a, of a dog, for example. And you see those types of claims. And in some way, in terms of like problem solving, th th that is accurate. But in some ways, especially like shared intentionality, like you said, in terms of, in terms of, 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 of social mechanisms, they're way way ahead and the book just completely demolishes this this equalization between between children and animals and that was that was mind-blowing to me yeah no this is a real talent that we have and this ability this a shared we space attention intentional tracking it's a very complicated task but we come prepared uh to be quite gifted in it relative to the animal kingdoms and by the way that's going to then set the stage for the context of justification because we can sync up our implicit intersubjectivities and then be able to tap into explicit propositional intersubjective stuff when you mentioned these different aspects of, of the influence uh, matrix uh how do you conceptualize uh, variation within it do you see it has as a genetic inheritance that's something like personality traits or do you see it has uh, cultural factors uh, that shape the disposition of, of where they, they end up? And also, I'm curious about how you think about the continuum between each factor. Do you, do you, is there a point that you consider them uh, dysfunctional, especially in the therapy context? Or do you see it has, you know, they just totally call whatever? Beautiful questions. Okay. So the argument is that there, there is a basic evolved human natural architectural structure that's mapped by the matrix, okay? So we come prepared, it maps all of Tomasello's kind of stuff that's, a, if you get a typical developmental structure, you are you are prepared to track your relational value and social influence. In other words, you're um, early on, kids understand what it's like to be abandoned and rejected <laughs> versus loved and taken care of. And they are primed and prepared to want belonging, connection, honoring, respect, and feel very averse to that, okay? So that's like, just like you don't learn if you cut your finger, huh, is I'm supposed to have a negative or positive reaction to this? It's like, no, okay? The structure is built and the structure is built to understand vertical, horizontal, uh, and distancing uh, at that level. So that's embedded. Um, absolutely though, you're gonna get different frequency distributions on these tendencies, okay? Meaning that as you get one, you may get another that then comes around for be an advantage. Um, if I've done research on this, so if you know trait theory and personality, they're big five uh, traits, okay? Uh, the animal structure in us, okay, starts with the two big five elements of neuroticism, okay, and uh, extroversion. Neuroticism is your negative affect tendency. That's in your animal system and your ext extroversion is your exploration, sensation-seeking, positive drive system, 
So that's in your animal, okay? The matrix, the influence matrix pulls that up and puts that in the social dimension where you want to approach and be engaged in high relational value, high social influence, okay? Extroverted people are naturally social and engaged in that. They sort of seek that in a particular approach sort of way and be positively inclined to it. Okay. Uh, low introverted people are definitely maybe motivated toward it, but will not have the releasing, desiring energies to engage in it. Okay. Will feel shy in relationship to that. Ex neuroticism then is tracking your sense of low relational value and the negative emotions like sadness and despair, uh, anxiety, also shame, guilt, as well as contempt and anger. Okay. These are the negative affects that are then primed coming from the neurotic system. And then you get what's called agreeableness, okay? Agreeableness is that the general disposition along both your motivated structure, like am I motivated to be affiliative and caring, okay? And your behavioral repertoire stylistic way of being in relation. Are you tender-minded and go along, get along and polite? Or are you disagreeable, curmudgeonly and, you know, challenging? So those are, there's a stylistic and a motivational aspect on agreeableness, and the matrix basically says, yes, you'll be dispositionally inclined to have repertoires and motives. If you're high agreeable in both, you're both compassionate and go along, give along, okay, agreeable. And that's on the red line positivity. If you're uh, low, then you're hostile, competitive, aggressive, okay? Uh, and then it can be, again, it's dispositionally at stylistic behavioral repertoire, like how you treat other people, because you can have, so for example, you can have the old classic curmudgeonly, but good hearted man. You know, it was like old man, it's a grip and blah, blah, blah. Or like uh, Roy Kent. And if you do, if you watch any uh, um, uh, Ted Lasso, there's a uh, there's Roy Kent is a soccer player in that. He's always cursing and unbelievably disagreeable, but everybody loves him because underneath that, he's got a kind motivational sense of heart. Okay. So the motivator is good for him, but he's very disagreeable in style. Okay. Um, and you see, so he's actually angry and critical and judgmental. Um, but ultimately, when push comes to shove, he totally wants to take care of people. Um, so that's the that's the fundamental structure of the dispositional tendencies that people would have across a distribution of behavioral genetic variation. Okay, you get that. Now that I'm not a genetic, like I don't think traits are determined. You get channeled into what are called epigenetic processes of development that, that drive experiential feedback, activate certain genes. Certainly, if you have a certain behavioral genetic, we know you're more likely to get channeled in one way or the other, but experience is always feeding back on that. Um, and so the lived experience in relation, what's your attachment system? What do you see other people do? Blah, blah, blah. And then finally, because we're cultured persons, the justification system dynamic of what's legitimizing is and ought in terms of self other relations plays a big role in how these things evolve. I'll give you an example. Eastern cultures tend to develop the center of justification around higher order we spaces like the family or the group. OK, Western culture emphasize or center the system of justification at the individual. All right. If you locate the system of justification at the individual where the unit of the self is the individual as opposed to the unit of self being the we space versus them, me versus you. OK, if your system of justification legitimizes that, then that changes the way the influence matrix feeds back on in, in complex dynamic systems. OK, so you can get socialized to shift the focus. The focus will, is, is flexible. It's adaptive. It's actually a cybernetic system. So it's very much. Uh, completely situation dependent, uh, but it does explain why we get dispositional variation, like for the agreeableness to disagreeableness line. Mm -hmm. And w when we're talking about this, we're talking in terms of personality, well, s some way, making a parallel at least with kind of personality traits. Uh, yeah, uh, that, I mean, that's that, exactly what that is. The trait, you know, the extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism are three of the big five. Uh, and uh -huh. traits, you know, that's true. Um, and, and something that occurred to me is that you, you can kind of make a parallel. I'm, I'm forgetting the name now, but the, the, the scale that uh, height developed. Can you help mm -hmm. me out here? Sure. A psychopath. Uh, what's the name? Uh, are you talking about psychopath scale? No, 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 no. Um, oh, that's hair. I'm sorry. Uh, 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 Jonathan Haidt. Uh, oh, Haidt. Yeah, of course. Uh, Jonathan Haidt in terms of the moral. So, yes, yeah. he's got five yeah, yeah. and now six um, moral polarities. Okay. M uh, moral foundation. Moral foundation theory. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, uh, do, do you see a parallel with that as well? Because oh, in totally. terms of personality, it's the individual, but then the moral foundations that he'll develop, it's kind of like 
kind of the political inclination of the indivi- of the of the disposition of the individual to organize the social. Hundred, hundred percent. You can apply, and you can just take. I did this in a blog. You can take the influence matrix, okay, and look at things like care and fairness. That's an affiliative tendency, and look at things like loyalty. Uh, and sacredness, those are actually vertical aspects of, of, of relating. Then you do liberty versus suppression, that's the green line, okay? So you can take the tendencies and dispositions that would be the collective concerns in relationship to the moral foundations through the influence matrix. That will share show you what the various polarities are likely to be and then why different justification systems are trying to legitimize is ought different facets of them. OK, so some people will be inclined to live in a particular kind of vertical system of hierarchy that's called you know, authoritarianism and the, so the r- willingness then to submit to legitimate authority and grant power to those individuals who deserve it. That's sort of a classic conservative position versus, oh, my God, I can't believe that you would cr- create a system where it's inherently unfair, you know, based on some arbitrary value that's unbelievably injurious to individuals. So care and fairness dynamics become from a more liberal perspective. The red line, which, by the way, is also archetypally more feminine, archetypally more masculine. It's not surprising that males are more conservative, females are more liberal. I mean, you can do the whole structural analysis of that. Yes, I, I went and presented at Jonathan Knight's lab back in 2008. We, oh. we synced up completely in relationship to the matrix, more foundations, righteous wow. mind, justification. All of that is basically enormously parallel. Awesome. Perfect. I didn't know that. And have you ever tried to link kind of your theory and, and these more established um, domains through actual study? Because I've seen that a lot of the work that you've put out um, is very theoretically, very theoretical, obviously. Uh, but also I've seen that you've, you've kind of been uh, struggling a bit to kind of get it accepted, at, at least in terms of its significance. And, and I wonder if, if, if a good way to kind of make people realize kind of the value of it is to kind of, for example, make scales that then are proven to act in concordance um, to other theories that psychology already uses. Uh, and then, and then, if you can link those together, then 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 maybe it, it's easier for the for the field to realize. Oh, so this is just not just some random ass theory from a dude, but this can actually make sense at an empirical level through that theory. Yeah, we I've already done that. Yeah, uh, but you're right. Uh, so yeah, like we did the influence matrix scales. We demonstrated very clearly. Uh, and I can share that stuff with you. Demonstrate very clearly that predictions are realized with relationship to things like. Well, there's a whole host of different variables, big five just being one of them. So um, we made predictions about how much variance we would account for by extroversion, neuroticism, and agreeableness relative to, say, conscientiousness and openness, and which ones would afford your regression prediction. So we gave it to 1,000 people, and those things were confirmed. There's a dissertation that did that. Um, and, and so the short answer is absolutely yes, okay? Um, I would be much better off in terms of getting this out there, if my inclination and willingness to go through the standard empirical expectation was strong enough to do that, okay, my inclination, my disposition, uh, for a whole host of reasons we can talk about, my disposition is not to do that, okay? I mean, I've done it, but to go through it in a particular way, to play the game that is played, their whole reason, and I'm, I don't, I like the game in some ways, I'm a critic of the game in other ways, um, I am certainly actually bringing my current book is really just basically arguing that the the structure of the empirical system in psychology is essentially corrupt, okay? Uh, We have corrupted the nature of the empirical enterprise. uh, And ultimately, that's not to say we haven't discovered a whole bunch of good shit. You got people like Jonathan Haidt doing brilliant shit out there uh, with some standard empirical work. I'm not fundamental. I obviously wouldn't make a blanket statement. That's all bullshit by any stretch. A lot of brilliant stuff. The fundamental structure of its organization needs to be changed at its core, it is produces a hell of a lot more noise than uh, music in its current structure. Um, and part of that is this commitment to variable aggregate analysis. So variable aggregate analysis, we put all the shit in the thing, watch the variable and al- aggregate analysis, make predictions in relation to correlation, discriminative and um, uh, you know convergent validity patterns and say, oh, I have my little thing and it operates the way I think it does in this variable aggregate space. That's the standard um, model of, of psychology. Actually, I think that's fundamentally broken. Uh, humans are not variable aggregates. We have to have a framework that actually bridges variable aggregate analysis to the actual ontology of this conversation, okay? Where this is not a variable aggregate conversation. This is me justifying my investment and influence to you. 
and then you internalizing and deciding the justifiability of this and us navigating our investment and influence patterns. We're not variable aggregates. Okay. This, the science of psychology actually has completely misconstrued its actual subject matter and turned it into fucking variable aggregates without knowing how to train it back into individuals. Jim Lemiel has done some unbelievably excellent work on this. And that just shows the ontological error of the field. And people are running around trying to make interpretations of variable aggregate clouds for their particular individual lives. But to pull off a variable aggregate translation to the individual is a very complicated thing, especially if you don't have a good model of the actual individual investment influence justification tendencies. And if you don't do that, that translation is a nightmare. So I have a whole host of reasons to buy like, yeah, I could have played the game and but my disposition is such that it wouldn't let me anyway. I'm a fucking theorist, not an empiricist. You know, if I were in physics, I'd totally be a theoretical physicist, not an experimentalist. Um, that's where my head is. But I actually even have old justification why the experimental enterprise is way overshot and basically corrupt. Well, just in terms of your disposition, uh, a way to do it is if you don't want to bother with it, just put undergrads doing it. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's, I mean, I, that, I, I mean, I'll, we did it. I didn't even, I, I should have published that. It's a really interesting set of studies. Um, uh, yeah, and I am, you know, maybe I'm just being my anti-authoritarian self, maybe just being in the middle finger and I'm being unnecessarily oppositional. Um, but whatever, you know, there it is. Uh, that's, I haven't, I have done it enough to know that it works. Um, and I'm also really trying to make the point that actually we've underplayed our ontology metaphysical dynamic. And I'm here to tell you how to do that right. That's what's really missing. That's what I can do. That's a fundamental shift in the field. And that's what I'm trying to pursue. Right, I understand. And in terms of the, of the of of the of the corrupt foundations, uh, I'd love to get more depth into it, but perhaps for another time because I, I still wanted to get a bit into therapy. Uh, but perhaps if you have the opportunity to talk some other time, maybe after you publish your book, I would love to get really deep. I would be. I'd be happy to. I, I really enjoyed talking with you. Be happy to come along and uh, whatever you feel. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's entertaining. I'm here to share my uh, journey and passion and vision. And if you find it valuable, I'd be more than happy to do that. Perfect. Awesome. So, um, so I'd like to talk about a, bit, a little bit about uh, therapy. Like I really respect therapists, especially well-informed, experienced uh, therapists. So, so uh, I really value the position that you're in and I think you can have a lot to offer. Uh, but w one of the areas that I, that I would like to bring up first is, is cognitive behavioral therapy. And there's two things that I would like to touch on. One is uh, kind of your background, uh, very short, it doesn't have to be uh, in, in depth at all. Uh, but I know you have some, some background into it. I would like to know about that and kind of uh, your relationship with Beck, which unfortunately he has passed away very recently. Um, and then I also have a more specific question and this and you're a pretty good person to ask this. And this has come into my mind recently because I had to write a paper on, on uh, well, not a paper, an essay on cognitive behavioral therapy. And one of the things that I put on the paper is that one of the criticisms about cognitive behavioral therapy is that it has all this machinery of what causes depression. Uh, but then when it compares to other therapies that don't use that machinery at all, it kind of does the same thing. In terms of in terms of results, in terms of outcome, but also something that bothers me is that kind of what launched cognitive behavioral therapy into such a strong position inside. Well, there's actually several variables into it that that played into that. But one of the big ones was that there was actually a decent amount of research validating the cognitive theory behind cognitive behavioral therapy. So, for example, if you know you can make predictions of depression based on the schemas that people have or the cognitive distortions that people have. And that's something that confuses me because on one hand, it kind of validates the cognitive theory in, in a causal manner, but then how do other therapies that don't use that mechanism at all still have the same results? Totally. So, so, so how do those things get together? <laughs> Great questions. Uh, and actually I can tell you also why I find the empirical enterprise corrupt. <laughs> Too. And that can be, maybe we hit all three of these uh, as we sort of wrap up. So, um, so yeah, my I came in, I got trained, I swallowed sort of a, the what I now call the modernist pill of, of sort of science to truth kind of idea in undergrad. So I was like, oh, I love psychology. It asks scientific questions. Now we're no better than bullshit folk psychology. 
And I was impressed with the general structure of sort of the social cognitive sciences, Bandura. And then if you take that kind of notion and like go into therapy, you become naturally inclined toward cognitive behavioral therapy. I'm also pretty instrumental, analytic, um, intellectual in the way I think about adaptive living. Um, so a kind of stoic, cognitive, instrumental problem solving approach comes naturally to me. Um, so that's all alignment. And I was under the impression that the empirical research uh, suggests that CBT are the evidence-based therapies and the other stuff doesn't, you know, is, doesn't, isn't as effective. I had, had bought that line as an undergraduate. Uh, they used to promote that line. Um, and then I went into the world of graduate training, the actual real world. I got trained by some people and realized that entire thing is just bullshit. I mean, the, the, the entire structure of that argument, uh, and I can explain with more detail. The reality in the therapy world are that bona fide, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the reality is that the bona fide treatments delivered by effective individuals get the same, more or less the same outcomes. It's called the dodo bird finding. I am uh, actually now uh, in the next month, I'll be formally president of the Society for the Exploration of Psychotherapy Integration. Um, this is a formal group, a society devoted to uh, aware of what's called common factors and the power of what are called common factors across the different things, meaning that, hey, we, what is it that is that all these damn systems are getting very similar outcomes for? So what are they all, what is there an underlying common set of factors that is actually happening in the therapeutic process? And the answer is definitely yes. <laughs> uh, there's shared underlying factors that are driving a huge amount of the outcome. Okay. Um, so, so you get this whole issue about, oh, actually the best of the best do the best in the bona fide therapies. Virtually all of them do very similarly. There are certainly idiosyncratic exceptions in particular conditions. Um, but the general psychotherapeutic cluster of what I would call neurotic conditions, unsatisfied people dealing with depression and anxiety with problems in living problems in their ego self felt way of being in the world past traumas that are interrupting their functioning and making them feel trapped and, and maladaptive that's the core of psychotherapy okay neurotic internalizing conditions and then the issue is what drives that and then what are the psychotherapeutic process that unfold and help okay so um I then I did my dissertation on cognitive errors. It was going to be on the unified theory, but I was that empirical thing. It's like you'll never get a job doing theory. You can't do theory, you know. It's like, it's like all right, like Harold Lightenberg. Like I did get a job because of my theory, uh, but ultimately uh, I had to do. But I did get my postdoc because I did my dissertation on the concept of cognitive errors. Okay, I did an experimental analysis of cognitive errors, whereby people were measured to see their tendency to make negative or positive cognitive interpretations of ambiguous stimuli. And then I tested them when they got negative feedback, whether that shifted their mood in predicted ways. So if you may tend to make positive cognitive errors and you got positive feedback, you feel more happy versus tend to make negative cognitive errors. Okay. And the actual answer is, yeah. And I was the first actual experimental evidence that cognitive error tendency was related to mood reaction uh, and, and, and is the best design clear experimental causal evidence. Actually, we found that actually is the positive errors that were really predictive far more and of positive feeling. Uh, the negative errors were more ambiguous. Um, but anyway, I published that result uh, in, in, you know, and then I- the Sorry, sorry. Could you just repeat that about the, the, the positive? I didn't, I didn't get it. Yeah. So uh, cognitive errors were not a heavily studied aspect of Beck's. Beck had three broad domains of, ma of, of cognition core beliefs, okay, which then became analyzed through what's called the dysfunctional attitude scale. These are the core belief. It was at least meant to measure the core beliefs. Then there were automatic thoughts. Those were the automatic things that would pop into people's heads. Then there were these intermediate level inferential tendencies, which would then say, if it happens, something ha is here, then it means this, okay? This is what he called cognitive errors uh, initially. Now they become called intermediate beliefs, okay? And then the issue is whether or not your 10, we had a cognitive and a negative and positive error scale, which would say, okay, for example, uh, some ambiguous thing happens, uh, like you walk by somebody, they don't wave. Are you likely to interpret that they don't like you? Okay. So if they walk by and then in wave, then you would say, hey, you know, then you'd have some of the, say, oh, that person clearly doesn't like me. They're ignoring me and they don't like me. Then you say, is that really true of me? Okay, or not true of me. So you, there's 32 items that basic 16 of which are positive, like uh, this ambiguous positive thing happened. Oh, they really love me. This is good about me. 
this ambiguous negative thing happened, oh, that means they're really bad about me. Okay, you get 16 items, you get people measuring those items, they get a positive error score and a negative error score. Okay? I then had a feedback manipulation where people got positive or negative social feedback. I told them they were in a first impression study. They get together, they had a five minute conversation, they'd run back to their thing and rate everybody. Okay. And, and things like likability, friendliness. They come back the next week and I give them what they think are their real scores, but are, that's the manipulation. They either get scores that they're 95th percentile in likability, friendliness, conversation skill, or in the eighth percentile of likability, friendliness, and skill. That's then the mood manipulation that you're a lousy or a, a good person. And then I measure the mood shift. Uh, then I get a mood thing. And then I compare last week's mood to this week's mood relative to the independent variable of positive. And then I pr predict the cog use the cognitive error prediction to then say, hey, positive error plus this mood shift. And we get a significant you know, impact of the intersection, basically. You can say, yes, people that have po high positive cognitive error tendencies got positive feedback and their mood was able, I was able to predict that variable aggregate mood and say, if you tend to have this and you got this feedback, you tend to, your mood tended to go up. Uh, that was actually a bigger finding than people that tended to make negative cognitive errors got negative feedback and their mood went down. I see, I see. But, uh -huh. that, that's funny because I, I remember reading a paper uh, recently I don't want to be too confident about this because maybe I misinterpreted because I kind of just skimmed the, the the study. But I think they kind of made that observation, and and they I think they made it as as if it was novel. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I certainly my review of the literature. So I published that in 1999. Um, you know, I believe that's well, maybe the actual publication came out a little later than that. I got accepted then. Um, that so the cognitive therapy. I mean, the, the prediction. Nobody had done that. And that's why I got hired at Beck. Beck would love that fucking study. You know, I then went and then I went to work with Beck in 1999. Uh, you know, I public, I got that study. I got my dissertation through that, even though I was doing all my work on the unified therapy. And we care about that. You still had to do a dissertation uh, that's empirically based and measurement based because that's really the only thing that matters um, and has any validity in the context. So then you then I was done with my doctorate and then I was looking for a job and I saw Beck's lab at the University of Pennsylvania was hiring a postdoc. OK. And so then I went to work with Beck and was at the University of Pennsylvania as a postdoc from 1999. Uh, well, I was there for two years of postdoc. Then I got hired as a research assistant professor until 2003. And it was at 2003 I went to James Madison University, and that's where I still am as a full professor. Um, so that's why I was four years at Beck. What I did at Beck um, was uh, shortly after I got there in October of 1999, they had put in for a big grant. Um, actually at CDC and uh, NIMH uh, to run a randomized con clinic, uh, control clinical trial for individuals who recently made a suicide attempt, okay? Um, and it was the largest study focused directly on suicide behavior. So the outcome variable here is suicide behavior. We wanna reduce suicide behavior, okay? Um, and we built a cognitive therapy intervention for that. Um, and uh, other people that built it, you have to do what's called a pilot and feasibility study, so you have to show. So the postdocs before me did all that, submitted it, had enough what's called power analysis, say, hey, if we have 60 people in each group, randomized controlled to the treatment group, and then the just whatever what's called treatment as usual versus cognitive therapy, and then we run them, we should have power to say that this intervention works, okay? Those people left and I came in, and then I ran the study. I was project director for this multi-million dollar study, okay? And then I get there, but everybody then had built, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm just straight out doc. Okay. This is a fucking shit show. It's like, all of a sudden it's like, okay, now run this multi-million dollar study in a population of inner city Philadelphia, where every person's coming in with and made a serious suicide attempt. I mean, that's the criteria to get in the study. So everybody that's going to be coming in is a serious, okay. Issue. We have a quarter of the people are homeless. Um, most people have suicide, uh, substance use problems. Almost everybody's been abused. We have in three quarters live below the poverty line. This is an inner city, West Philadelphia population that I end up with. And then you have to deliver therapy to them. You have to find them. I mean, it's an unbelievable challenge. So here's the, you want to know about corruption, why I feel like the system's totally corrupt. So essentially what happens, I get dropped in this 
first two months is a shit show. I'm trying to figure out. Finally, I solve what's called the recruitment problem. Okay. The recruitment problem is where are these people? How do I connect with them? How do I actually get them in the study? Well, it took me two, three months just to even find where they'd be, how to hook them up. So then I finally find them because we're now all of a sudden we're way behind. Uh, you got to bring in at least one person a month and I'm bringing fucking anybody in the first three months. I mean, we one, one a week we're supposed to bring in. Well, then I find them and I tap into it and I figure out how to get them and I solve the recruitment problem. Okay. With, which means basically I know where they are. I bring people in. I'm actually above the, I beat the uh, idea of we have 60 people in the study by the end of the first year. Okay. But here's the deal. So half of them, 30 are getting assigned to this cognitive therapy branch and 30 are in this enriched care. You, you know, flip a computer coin, one, they go here, zero, they go there. Okay. <clears throat> but the, and the design of the study is a two year follow up. You follow them up at one month, three months, six months, and then year, 18 months, two years. They're supposed to get at least 10 sessions of cognitive therapy. That's the delivery. Okay. So these are, like I said, a quarter of these people are homeless. Okay. Three quarters live beneath the poverty line. All right. This is this is a very, very intense. Uh, we, you know, the, the whole ecology is pretty dysfunctional. Okay. It's pretty brutal. All right. Well, we set it up. I mean, the, the design is okay, you get in the cognitive therapy, you then go to the center for cognitive therapy. That's the, was the design, which was in this up high rise building near us where we were in the psychopathology research unit. Great therapists there, but they're normal therapists, meaning that they have they have regular outpatient clinics and People are supposed to show up at two o'clock in their office. And they normally, if they have a normal client, they show up at two o'clock most of the time. Well, what we found was these people were not going to go into West Philly, show up at two o'clock on Tuesday. Okay. They just didn't. That's not what, you know, that's not that lifestyle. In fact, after a year out of 30 people, we had one third of the people that had gone to more than three sessions. One third of the people that went between one and three sessions and then dropped out. And one third of the people didn't go to any goddamn session at all. That's in 30 of our treatment delivery. A third don't see a therapist at all. The other third see it between one and three. And the other, only a third get four more sessions. Okay. Well, I then deliver, there's this whole story about actually Beck all of a sudden calls me up. He tells me, all right, I uh, surprised the shit out of me. He's like, what's the update on the story? Although I've been giving him monthly updates and we're in front of 20 people. Okay. And Beck just calls me up and summarizes the data. Okay. He, right before I was coming over, he's like, we're going to do a summary of the, <laughs> holy shit, this isn't going to go well. <sighs> so I get up there and then I, and Beck goes fucking ballistic. I mean, he's like, what? We're going to lose all our money. What the hell's happening down there? This is impossible. You're going to, you, you, and so then we have this legendary meeting in August, okay, of that year. It's a year later. I brought all the people, but we're losing them. Obviously, this study's shit. There's, you can't. So he, that comes in, he wouldn't use come into the office and everybody's all tense, super angry, blah, blah, blah. And we completely redesign the study. Okay. And what we do is we then decide we have money. We hire people. We hire another postdoc that I'm going to train actually two eventually. Um, and then I train them and I take over the therapy. Okay. So I'm, and then we hire other people because I was doing all the assessment and follow-up. So then we change the design of the study. OK, so that now I'm the therapy person. And guess what? I go to people's houses if they show up at the wrong time, if it blah, blah, blah. I mean, I did therapy with a woman next to a crack house and a pit bull <laughs> still watching me the whole time. It was not confrontational. OK, I mean, one more from that goddamn dog. I was done. All right. You know, that was a vicious fucking dog anyway. Um, and crack, you know, shots going off and go to somebody's house. I mean, it was unbelievably intense. And I was basically told you either do is you're fired. OK. Um, so, so then we figured this out, but we changed the entire, we also changed all the ways we related to people. We got them bus tokens. We did all these social work interventions. Okay. And I'm, and I'm an integrative therapist. I'm not doing cognitive therapy. I'm doing smart cognitive, the whole damn thing. Okay. So essentially we totally restructured the therapy, do basically a series of social work interventions, shift the way we're going to actually maintain what really should have been titled then, you know, interventions for marginalized populations. OK, what then gets justified is, oh, these are necessary study tweaks to deliver the intervention. So in the night 2005 empirical publication, it's cognitive therapy for suicide attempters. Why it's successful. And do they say anything about study one versus study two? Not a word. OK, I'm going to tell anybody that actually when we literally tried to deliver this in the standard cognitive therapy model, it fell flat on its face. Didn't do anything. And we completely changed it. So it really didn't look like cognitive therapy at all. Certainly not the way it's normally delivered. 
Okay. And do we tell anybody about that? I mean, I would when I go out and process it. But they do make it into the JAMA article? Not at all. Why? Because the whole goddamn thing was brand promotion. I mean, this is all about Beck's ego. He wants to be the next Freud, you know, and cognitive therapy needs to win the day. And that's what the whole structure was designed around. So the founding father of the empirical science, and God bless his soul, he's a good man. I'm sorry to say this, but this is exactly what I've been saying all the goddamn time, was a brand promotion scheme. It was an advertisement for cognitive therapy. That's what the science did. So if the science is really fucking brand promotion, how the hell is that actually going to work at the level of integrity? It didn't. And it pissed the shit out of me. I can tell. You know, well, I mean, you know, seriously, I mean, talk, we're talking about, I mean, the implications of this are really serious, right? I mean, if JAMA yeah, and, and, and what are we actually doing to try to help these people and what we're actually going to try to fall? I mean, you want truth. The whole goddamn reason of the epistemic value of science is actually accuracy. I mean, that's a, and then the idea that you're actually promoting that we're the science and then you actually really can't look in the mirror and say it's accuracy. It's egoic brand promotion. That's that's, you know, and unfortunately, the confusion around psychology actually justifies that. I would I might, I can't even necessarily say that whole thing. You step back. It's totally. But is it unethical? The actual justification systems of psychology actually afford it. So you can't really in the context, but at the level of integrity, that's corrupt. <sighs> The whole thing about the study is just is just insane. Like I can I can barely process it. But I had noticed that before. Um, that cognitive behavioral therapy has a movement really started to get this self driving branding type thing that I can't quite explain. Which which is not too unreasonable unreasonable in the sense that unexpected like like these things when they go mainstream it's just kind of unavoidable the contingent of course you have to you got to get attention you got to package it you got you know it's a competitive job people can believe in it there's certainly reasons i mean i you know went in it and believed in it but yes this whole issue of brand promotion schools of thought all of this that's what the whole the purpose of the unified theory at least in the context now of psychology although i'm actually now at the societal level like holy fuck we got meaning and mental health crisis a lot bigger in psychology and this can address it but inside the psychology is we can consolidate our knowledge and convey it to individuals a hell of a lot more effectively uh, than we're doing in these the broken research paradigm on this academic side and the school of thought brand promotion, you know, ACT or ACT or, you know, CBT, all of what Marv Goldfrey calls the alphabet soup approach uh, of trying to like, oh, get people channeled into particular brands and sell those books and get certification in that all thing. You know, the, the, the structure is deeply problematic. And coming back to, to, to my question uh, about kind of this, this joint between outcomes across ter- therapies and kind of um, isolation outcomes of the cognitive theory, um, you can actually, the, the, the latter part, that's actually, well, it's not completely, but it can be divorced from modern CBT. Because it's it's quite it's quite quite old research. It's kind of like the paradigm that kind of got the whole thing started, and so so, so how exactly is is the disconnect happening? Why why is cognitive theory uh, have evidence that kind of it can it it drives depression outcomes, but then non cognitive therapies do the same thing? Yeah. So uh, so let's. I mean, if we look at it through the lens of unified theory, okay, I think we can make good sense out of it pretty quickly. Okay. So you have, you have a justification system, for example, this is really, it's going to correspond in the language of the cognitive is a really complicated term. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and really what Beck really honed in on and is the justification system. That is the self-talk propositional network system. Okay. That then legitimizes is and odd about the way the world is and whether you're hopeless and pessimistic or hopeful and optimistic. Okay. And, and at least at a base level relative to um, things like depression. How do you think about self? How do you think about world? How do you think about future? That's called the triad. Okay. And the schematic activation that tends to justify negative outcomes, problematic issues, blah, 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 and, and anticipate ineffectiveness, whatever. Um, you can definitely see that these things have particular kinds of uh, causal, uh, well, pseudo causal or whatever. And if you have this, it makes you vulnerable. These things happen. You get a diathesis stress that actually works. Okay. But if you, and that's, and there's certainly validity to that, but let's remember that we are complex adaptive dynamic systems. In fact, I have the fifth branch there. It's called CAST, which are character adaptation systems. And it shows the different kinds of mental adaptation systems that are all nested together 
and feed back on each other in particular ways. Okay. So what is depression? Well, uh, one of my, that's actually one of the first concepts I really analyzed. And I argued that depression is a state of behavioral shutdown, really technically mental behavioral shutdown. Okay. And essentially what's happening is, is that the investment system, okay, what you have is like, hey, you got a work effort system that's deploying effort to gain particular outcomes in the world and avoid other outcomes. That's what you're doing. And what happens in depression is essentially that investment system feels constrained. It can't get a good return on investment for a whole host of different reasons. There are, of course, biophysiological aspects, but there are learned aspects, there are justificatory aspects, there are situational aspects. And ultimately, the best way to think about depression is a state of behavioral shutdown. Okay? When you get depressed, you get channeled in, and the system then decreases its investment. And at the experiential core of the animal body, what's happening is you have a positive and negative affect system. So you energize approach, okay, positive system, you know, avoidance and withdrawal, negative system. When the system phases into depression, what essentially happens is the positive system gets pulled down, that's called anhedonia, and the negative system jacks up in terms of its sensitivity. So you're in a negative valence system. Okay. Now, the as Jonathan Haidt will tell you, okay, what you have in the justifying system is essentially a rider sitting on top of an elephant. Okay. And what the elephant does is it grabs with emotion and motivation and perception. It grabs the rider and says, hey, this is where I want to go. And then the rider, what it does is it justifies, oh, usually post hoc justifies, okay. And now I'll legitimize why. If you're skilled about it, you develop frontal lobe activation and you can anticipate what the hell the elephant's going to do and get a good, be a good rider. And that's one of the big problems of being a person and how to be an effective person, get the fucking rider and the elephant going together. But the point of it is, is that there's a deep and intimate relationship between the mood of the elephant, the kind of justification system the rider has and the feedback between the two. Okay. So, so what does that mean? If you, I can have all of these cognitive tendencies and they would be predictive. If I'm, if I'm pessimistic, negativistic, looking for, I have low self-efficacy, bad things are going to happen. That feeds back on my feeling system. Okay. At the same time, if I look at you and you're really shut down, you, there is one, in terms of real mechanism of active intervention for depression, there's really one set of ideas that comes up across to me better than any others. And it's called behavioral activation therapy. If you really want to do the recipe that actually grind, fundamentally changes the mechanisms of depression, it's actually the behavioral approach does. I mean, they all get the same, but they're really, you can really see the mechanisms and delineate the mechanisms through what's called behavioral activation. What does that do? It increases one's mastery, control, and sense of effectiveness as you get engaged in the world. It's, it redesigns you. If you're really depressed, I'm going to get you to gain more pleasure, more mastery, more engagement with the world. That's what's behavioral activation therapy. It's like, I'm going to work with you and you're going to not want to get out of fucking bed. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to help you see that your gut reaction is to not get out of bed. Why? Because actually what depression does is it shuts your initiation for behavioral, your behavioral initiation system gets, that's what it does. It turns it off. So it's fucking getting out of bed. It's like, oh my God. So I don't want to get out of bed. Okay. I'll be better off. But then I tell you, actually, let's test you. On Tuesday, you don't get out of bed at all and you sit there. On Wednesday, you say, fuck it. I'm going to force my fucking self out of bed. Okay. I'm going to give myself a reward if I get out of bed, even though I know my initiation system is like, I don't want to get out of bed. Okay. And then we will test your mood on Tuesday versus Wednesday. And you know what you'll see? Is that if you get over the hump and get the momentum of your behavioral investment system going, then you look back on Wednesday and you're like, I wasn't super happy Wednesday, but Jesus fucking Christ, I spent all goddamn day in the bed Tuesday and that just sucked. As soon as I decided I wasn't getting in bed, I had the relief that I didn't have to work. And then I felt shitty and lousy. And then I felt guilty that I should get up. And then I tried to get up and then I haven't already gotten up. And you sit and you wallow in the shutdown. Okay. Wallowing in the shutdown turns out to be much more miserable than forcing yourself through the initiation. All right. And that's what behavioral activation, get that system, feeling some pleasure, feeling some mastery, feeling some efficacy, and then it will start to jack itself back up again. If it can find reinforcement, it will start to energize itself. Now, the point of this is, is though this fundamental, what's going to happen is as the system pulls, if you go to the elephant rider, if this is some behavioral activation, it's going to start shifting the justificatory access. Okay. In other words, the mood system pulls particular justification. Watch your own mood. When you're in a shitty mood, you get activated. Ah, oh, that's Nanawa. You get all your memory justification about why shit doesn't work, why things aren't fair, why the world sucks. 
because the affect system grabs a hold of the different tenor of justification. If you shift your affect system, it pulls different justification systems, okay? And they feed then back on each other. That's the key issue is to realize that your mood, and indeed this is the central cognitive insight, is that it's actually, it's not one versus the other, it's the proper understanding, the proper interplay, and either whether you're building a vicious maladaptive cycle where this negative reaction, and I call this actually triple negative neurotic looping, negative events happens, negative feeling happens, and then your justification says, I fucking hate this. I hate why that happened, and I hate myself for feeling that. This fucking sucks. And then you try to defend and control it, and then that creates a vicious negative feedback loop. It's called triple negative neurotic looping. It's at the core of the neurotic problem. What you have to do is you have to realize negative shit's going to happen. You're going to have negative feelings, but the key is to control mindfully that secondary reaction and reverse it and then know how to hold the emotion, know how to relate to the system and not shut yourself down and then create virtuous cycles. The point though is, is that there's a constant dynamic interface between your experiential system and also your relationship system and your justification system. And so they can certainly, you can isolate them and say, oh yeah, cognitive tendencies will predict, but yeah, it's going to come from the bottom too. So it's tendency to shut down. And they're all going to feed back on each other. That was so good. That was amazing. <laughs> like, I feel like I'll need to rewatch this three times. And I, <laughs> I want to hire you from, and, and I want to hire you to describe every single psychiatry disorder <laughs> in those terms. Because uh, I, I feel like. I just is... put out a, I did just put out a podcast on DSM from the Utah perspective. I'll send you a link. Oh, fantastic. Please do. Um, so. One of the things about, uh, well, there's a lot of problems about CBT, as we covered some, but uh, w one problem that also happens, um, again, beca also because of this mainstream aspect, is, is that it becomes too rigid. It becomes a program, you know? Okay, okay kind of a, a really thing that is very appealing, especially to, to governments, is that there's a plan. Totally. You have a little plan, and it's a delineated time, which is also very convenient for for, for money purposes. Uh, which has to be taken into account. I mean, people aren't, not everyone is rich, so it's an important consideration. But but anyway, it's this very rigid thing that is very standardized. And and it's also very empirically validated, at least that, that, that that's the claim. That, that the, is the, the claim. Thing, and, and, and at least that, that's the impression. And there's a whole problem with that. But then there's also the problem of how that problem occurred. Because the reason why they want something fixed and the, the reason why they want something empirical is because without those two, uh, especially without the latter, it can get a, a shit show very, very quickly. And, and as we talked about in the beginning of the podcast also, that, that this this is kind of like a, a reaction that we have towards the psychoanal psychoanalytic and also even further the philosophical background. And, and even, for example, even if we stay within the empirical framework, for example, I read a very good paper a few days ago, uh, which was titled How to Prove That Your Therapy is Effective, which is basically a sarcastic paper arguing about how different new therapies kind of have studies validating them, but those studies are are incredibly bad, well, uh, badly done, and they kind of biased in a hundred different ways to try to make that outcome appear. <laughs> I just gave a case example about how that might happen. <laughs> exactly, but but that's with that's with empiricism in mind. So so without with doing actual research. So if you take that away, then it's even worse. So so how how do we solve this problem? Of uh, on one hand, we don't want therapy to be rigid. We don't want to have a standardized thing for everything. But at the same time, we kind of need those things to avoid just having a complete shit show of of therapies that are complete. Non Totally. Uh, I mean, so my day job, you know, I'm a professor teaching people how to be psychological doctors. Okay. Uh, so that's what I do. And then the issue is, yeah, what's, what is this all about? And so, um, and how to do that. So my, my fundamental frame uh, is that you bring, it's actually called test rep is sort of the technical definition. And, and essentially it's training individuals um, in theoretically and empirically supported treatment and relationship principles and processes, okay? Uh, and it's the last two that's really key. So if you understand the, theor the metaphysical, ontological, the meta-theoretical structure of human mental behavior, that's I know a lot of tactical fucking jargon I bring, sorry. But it's basically, it's like, how do you, do you understand how people work, okay? And do you understand how people get into actual problems? And then do you understand how people would enter into the, a world of psychotherapy and begin an adaptive transformation process? 
Okay. Do you, that's the question. Do you understand those dynamics? And if you understand those dynamics in general, okay, then you can bring principles and processes to the real specific condition of the particular relationship that you have and enact a participatory dynamic. Now I'm using John Verveke's language here, a participatory dynamic identity to cultivate the dance toward adaptive outcome. And that's your task. Okay. Um, and so then the, then the fundamental issue is, well, what is the architecture that affords you reliably to get the variables in proper relation? What is the skill and competency sense so that I can enter, if you're my client, how do I enter your world, know the general problem area, and then know you, Tiago, as a particular unique individual, and how do I'm, I am going to interface as a unique individual myself in the real to cultivate the particular kind of principle and process relations that are associated with good outcome? with good theoretical justification. That's my task. And if you do that, and you do that reliably and effectively, well, then you're a good therapist and you've done good work. Fantastic. That, that's, that's, that's definitely a, a very um, interesting and at least to my un uneducated mind, a valid way to, to, to approach it. And if you want, when I come back, I can tell you much more about that, you know, in terms of there's, the, there's the whole unified approach side of the tree. So we talked about the left-hand side of the tree and tree of knowledge a little bit, and then justification, behavioral investment and matrix. Those are the four key ideas that afford an architecture for the meta theoretical uh, assimilation and integration of schools of thought and key findings that give you a coherent picture of what the science of basic and human psychology is. Okay. But then you have the whole issue of what's professional psychology that I call health service psychology. Um, and then what I built was the center of health service psychology is with individual psychotherapy for adults with neurotic conditions. Okay. That's sort of like, like most of the elements, but at the center of it is like, how do you do psychotherapy with depressed and anxious people? That's sort of at the core of a huge amount of our knowledge base. So then I organized that particular part with the right-hand side of the tree, articulating the character adaptive development dimensions and the fifth and sixth idea of the wheel of uh, development and the uh, character adaptation systems that delineates the picture of the building blocks of the person and the context and the kinds of problems. The next one is articulating what we mean by the concept of well-being, because you need to understand what you mean by well-being. If you're doing professional work, you have to have a fundamental analysis of optimal and dysfunctional patterns and know the judgments that you make to move towards optimal away from dysfunctional and how you make those judgments. And then finally, there's a thing called COMMO, which is an integrated approach to psychological mindfulness. And it's the fundamental way with COMMO, what it does is that it helps you identify these triple negative neurotic loops and why they drive people into problems with identity, affect, and relationship. And then brings COMMO, brings a particular principle and process set. So you learn how to see what those are, cultivate acceptance in certain regards, have loving, compassionate attitudes, and then are motivated toward value states of being calm. You get curious, accepting, loving, motivated toward value states of being. And then that is the way you reverse the triple negative neurotic loops into much more virtuous cycles and cultivate a coherent, integrated growth of the psyche that's a lot more optimal. Fantastic. Yeah. Like, uh, the reason, well, first of all, because of time constraints, but also I, I focus a lot more on, on the left side because that's kind of, first of all, I'm more familiar with it because I'm more familiar with the kind of theoretical side of psychology than clinical psychology per se, uh, but also because uh, I was a bit time limited in studying your work. And so I kind sure. of focus on that. But, no, it makes but, good sense. Uh -huh. But I absolutely love everything. And I would be absolutely delighted to talk with you again, um, di diving more deeply into these uh, theoretical problems, uh, talking more about therapy. There's a lot more points I would like to bring up. There's a whole section about spirituality that I'd like ah, to talk nice. about as well, <laughs> that we didn't even begin. Um, yeah, but um, this has been very long already. And uh, one, I'm actually running out of space on my camera. I have about, yeah. oh, zero seconds to run out already. Um, and and obviously, I'm also kind of eating your time a lot. So so this is a good place to end. But uh, I really appreciate you coming here. This was this was amazing on all fronts and beyond my expectations. Oh, well, fantastic. You know, so I know I come in high on the quack meter, but maybe I can leave uh, lower than that. Uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, and I've really, it's a great set of questions. Uh, I really appreciate the richness with which you're able to follow that helps me communicate it. Uh, it's been a real joy. So fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. It's great, great seeing day. you. We'll be in touch. Bye bye.